got your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And we're living in a day when our culture and society is, it's changing at a rapid pace like never before here in America. I mean, it's, it's every week you hear something that's trying to be changed. You know, I mean, it's up is down, down is up, right's wrong, uh, lies the truth, and and uh, evil's good and good's evil. I mean, it's every day something you hear, and yet in the midst of all this cancel culture, social injustice, and uh, socialist communist agenda that's taking place, God is correcting and getting His house in order that we can carry the glory of God. That's always been the goal. And in the midst of everything going on, you see this correction taking place and you see God bringing out His people to the forefront to stand out like He's always planned. And so... I'm, I'm, I'm excited that he is stirring in the hearts of believers. And it's becoming, uh, the thing that's really funny is it's becoming very uncomfortable to be a sideline, bench-sitting Christian. I mean, he's stirring people that had got to the point to where they just kind of stuck in a rut they're just not going anywhere, and God's stirring in them, and he's like, come on, it's time. And he's stirring that it's time to get these things going, and, and believers are becoming frustrated, and, and, and that's all part of God's plan to say, hey, come on, there's a lot more I got for you. There's a lot I'm doing for you, and, and, but we're fixing to have to change a few things. And let's look, in, in, like in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, it says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? It's very important. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. See, the world should be able to notice that there's something different about you. The world ought to be able to look at you and, and go, there's something different. What, what, what is going on. There's something different. There's something that I'm noticing that I don't notice in other folks. Everybody else is losing their mind, but you kind of seem to got your head together. You're living a different way. You're not, you're not being uh, influenced by all this that's going on in the world. You don't seem to be worried about what's going on. What's up with you? Come on. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with unbelievers? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols... For we are the temple of the living God. Listen, you may have common interests with people, but that doesn't equal common beliefs. Come on, are y'all with me? There may be common interests that you share with people, but that doesn't mean there you have that doesn't equal common beliefs. And so it's not you're just kind of going to be separate. It's not saying you can't be friends. Come on. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? With folks. Because you can be. But you're just not going to be yoked together. Because what fellowship does an unbeliever and a believer have? Look what he says. God just, just as God said... I will dwell in them and walk among them 
And I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's a promise. It's what God says. I, me, God, I'm going to dwell in you. And I'm going to walk among them. That's a promise. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. And I will become, I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. You have two commands and two promises here. If we come out and we come out and we separate ourselves and we do what God says and we don't touch what is unclean, there's a lot of unclean things out there. Listen, he says, I will be a father. In other words, I'll be a source for you. I'm going to be a source for your happiness, for your well-being, I'm going to be a source that for no fear, no doubt, no worry. Come on, are y'all with me? That's what God's saying. I'll come in, I'll dwell with you, and we're going to work some things out. See, this is the correction that is taking place to bring the presence of God back into the temple where he always wanted it, right here. This is always his goal is that we're the temple and that we glorify God through our daily walk in life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We read this a lot, and I think we miss a lot of this. See, God wants our spirit, soul, and body to be healthy. To be healthy. Look what he says in verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. Now you could stop right there and preach on that for a week. May God himself, how can he himself sanctify you? Because of the Holy Spirit, right? Because he wants to dwell in us, right? And he wants to walk among us. See, this is what's cool. When we're all the temple of God, he is in us, and yet he is still walking among us. So when unbelievers come in, it says he works with them through signs and wonders and miracles. Come on. Confirming the word that's being spoken. And so that's why a lot of folks have come in here and they'll come in and their bodies are being healed and things that were dead have come alive. I mean, it's, it, it's amazing what God does. There's people that's come in and they've just wept the whole service, wept for a whole year. Why? Because God is working on them. Why? Because he lives in you and he walks among us and you can't be in the presence of God without something being mashed, squeezed, pulled, molded. Come on, are y'all hearing me? That's why we don't have to tell you, look, it's, it's crazy to live together, get married. We don't have to come up here and beat you over the head about, listen, because God, the Holy Spirit, he'll work on you. And, and I've seen it. They've lived together, wouldn't change, and had to leave. And the ones that stayed, changed, got married, God healed them, they moved on. And they're growing, maturing. Come on, are y'all with me in here? I don't, nobody had to tell me I was a sinner. You didn't have to come tell me I was sorry. I knew I was. Come on. Something, I knew something wasn't right. God worked on that, squeezed on that. Got to work on that, boy. Come on. Listen, and it's so amazing when, when, when people come And they stay the course. And you can watch the word just work and move. And it's exciting to see people growing in the body. To I mean, not only growing, man, we're growing this thing from the ground up. And it's amazing to see what God's doing. 
but the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit, look what he says, and may your spirit and soul and body. There's an and in between each one of them because we are made up of spirit, soul, and body. We are three-part beings. God wants every one of those healthy. God's got the spirit man covered. When you receive and come to know Jesus, that spirit, when you recognize Jesus as Lord and Savior, that spirit man comes alive and it begins to work on the inside of you to make your body and your soul complete. Here on earth, not just in heaven. Come on. God wants us to be healthy here in soul and body. He doesn't want us walking around all fretting and worried and, come on, anxieties and, come on. It says God knows everything you need, right? But God wants us to work in him, work. He starts working on the inside and then the outside begins to change. And what we've done for years in the body of Christ is we wanted the outside to get on board first so it didn't embarrass everybody else in the church. Right? <laughs> I'll never forget a lady was, hey, have they passed the kitty yet? Talking about the offering bucket. Hey, have they passed the kitty yet? I'm like, you like to go to the casino, don't you? I thought that was hilarious. It happened to be the preacher's uh, mother-in-law. <laughs> and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. So that's why God is always at work on the inside of us going, there's more, take another step. There's more, take another step. There's one more level I want you to get to. There's one more level I want you to get to. But the problem with going from one level to the next level is you got to let go of that level to get to the next level. And there's a lot of things God's trying to get through you to get to you. And we end up clogging it up because we won't deal with some things in our life. We won't change some things that God's saying, you need to change this. You got some screwed up thinking in this area. You need to fix that. Come on, are y'all with me? See, that word sanctify, it means an influence of the Holy Spirit on the heart. That's what it means. To set apart for a common, set apart from a common to a sacred use. God is trying to get us out of a common life of sin, out of a common life of just existing. Come on. God never called you to just exist but to have a life of purpose and a life of destiny. God didn't want us to just be a bunch of miserable old sad sacks walking around, come on, that nobody wanted to be like. I remember going to church as a kid going, I don't want to be like none of them people. They don't look happy. That old man sleeps in the same spot every Sunday. Yeah. God wants us to be live, laugh, love. He wants our heart to be free so that He can come and dwell in us and carry His glory. But He's got to reshape and mold the vessel so that He can come in so we don't explode. <laughs> come on. To render clean in moral sense. See, God is going to work on our morality as well. 
There's going to be a lot of things that we can't do anymore. There's going to be a lot of things that we can do. The things that we can't do anymore are the things we don't need to do. Come on, are y'all with me? Because uh, the things that God says He doesn't want us touching are the things that are killing us. They're taking life away from us. Come on, man, are y'all with me? It's not that He wants you to be unhappy. It's that He wants you to live. Oh, man. Come on. We've been shallow surface Christians just happily playing church instead of being it way too long. Our faith in Jesus Christ is fixing to go to a whole nother level. It's not going to be surface. We can't forget what Jesus did on the cross. See, and we're to, we, are, we can't forget that we are to live according to this word. Look in Hebrews chapter 9. I don't, this is a, one of them audibles. I don't think y'all got that up there. But Hebrews chapter 9 in verse 11. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. That is to say, not of this creation and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifer, heifer sprinkled those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That's where we kind of find ourselves is that Jesus, <clears throat> when he came and went through the whole crucifixion and his blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat for us all, it allowed God to now come and dwell in this temple. Come on. How much greater is that than the blood of goats and heifers? Right? And so he made a way for God to be able to come and indwell in us. Man, look what it says. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, therefore allowing the Spirit of God to be that mediator, saying, hold on, we're in a process here. Grace that w is allowing us to walk this life out, living the demand that the Bible's putting on our life to live. You got it? Grace is taking us to get what we don't deserve. The blessings, the promises of God. Mercy is on this side. Oh, come on, man. Mercy is on this side and has our back going, telling the devil he's not getting what he does deserve. See, we have this mediator, Jesus, in between taking us to get the promises that we don't deserve because we haven't even matured yet, but mercy's saying they're not getting the condemnation, the guilt. Come on. So we're right here in this place where God is sanctifying and working us out for good. Come on, y'all got that? See, that's why being saved, saying a prayer, and sitting down doing nothing hasn't worked, and it's got us to this cancel culture, socialist, communist insanity that we're running through that everything's okay, we can live however we want, God is a God of love, and we can just act like whatever we want because grace covers us. Come on now. See, we haven't understood the work of Jesus Christ in our life. It's to get us to thinking morally correct and not corrupt. Come on. 
and maturing us to the fullness of the body of Christ so that we are carrying His glory and the world looks at us and goes, their God is God. Because we're reflecting the kingdom of heaven in everything we do. And let me tell you something, when we're reflecting the kingdom of heaven, you can't help but be happy and blessed and prosperous and whole and peaceful and healthy in soul and body. Come on, man. There's just something different about those people. And there's going to be a lot of folks that go, I hate it. Why, that would just worry me if we could not be friends. Davlin, she said she finally watched Tombstone last night. I said, well, maybe you can get saved now. I mean, my God, how long does it take? And she hadn't even watched uh, Lonesome Dove yet. And I'm like, good God, how do you live? I mean... I thought, my, my, she's getting close to getting saved. <laughs> I don't know if I could bear it. Listen, our spirit man has been set free, but our soul and our body that relates to life and relationships around us has got to be healed and worked through and Come on, are y'all hearing me? See, we haven't learned, and and that's how we've gotten so off track. We we don't know how to, our our soul and our body, it, it doesn't know how to relate in life without the knowledge of the Word. It gets corrupted. And we have corrupted a whole generation of people by thinking the Kardashians and the Bachelor is the way of life. I mean, we think manipulation, we think gossip, we, that ain't healthy, y'all. See, we don't even know how to recognize a toxic relationship when it comes into our life because we have been forming how to live off the Kardashians. Come on, are y'all hearing me? Manipulation is the sin of witchcraft. Rebellion. Listen, God didn't play. In the Old Testament, he said, if you got a rebellious teenager, you stone that little rascal. Let me tell you, we ain't got enough rocks in this country for all the little rebellious turds running around here now. <laughs> oh, man. It's a good thing we're under a new covenant. What is them piles of stones? Oh, that was Junior. <laughs> Listen, we react instead of respond with words of wisdom. See, we react in our flesh to stuff. We don't know how. Come on, we've gotten way out of control. Look in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And I'm going to tell you, I, it was crazy. It's amazing how many times you can read. I say this all the time, but it's amazing how many times you can read something in the Word and miss it. And then you can read something in the Word a hundred times and then all of a sudden, bam, something new. And so it's just, that's, the Word of God is alive, active, sharper than a two-edged sword, cutting and healing. It's, it's all of that, man. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now Solomon is finish, finishing his prayer and dedication of the temple. And David wanted to build God a house. And God's words were, were really, he was like, why do I need a house? 
the heavens is my throne and the earth is my footstool. There ain't a house big enough. But nevertheless, I'll let you build a place. You know? And so Solomon, he gathers all this, David gathers all this stuff so Solomon can build a temple where God's dwelling or God's eye is going to be upon, where his presence is going to be. In verse 1, now, verse, chapter 7, verse 1, Now when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Now, this is not, I don't, I don't know how, here's what I'm trying to say. When it says fire came down out of heaven, this fire came down out of heaven. And it, that's what it says. It's not a metaphorical, oh, 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 oh. No, what, no, this world of fire came down and consumed. Can you imagine? I mean, when God answered and that fire that when it fell, you know it never went, it never went out. There was a perpetual flame that burnt all the time. It's amazing. God is awesome that way. We forget that God is still alive. We forget that God right there, that fire came down and set everybody's eyebrows in the top of their head is still the same God. And it says, fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. I love verse 2. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. I mean, they couldn't even enter. It was just so thick. Man, that's what we need. Just the glory of the Lord. Look in verse 14. Solomon, in verse 11, it says, Solomon finished the house of the Lord in the king's palace, successfully completed that he had planned on doing in all the house of the Lord in his palace. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I've heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Look what God says. If I shut up the heavens so that there's no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people and my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Look at verse 15. Now my eyes shall be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now listen, God's intent from the very beginning, even when man didn't understand what the temple was going to be. Are y'all with me? God never intended to be in a building or in a tent he always intended to be among us and in us. We were going to be the temple, right? His glory was going to rest on us again, just like in the garden with Adam and Eve. Come on. His glory rested on Adam and Eve. He's trying to get us back to that position again where we are vessels that carry this glory, not just on the outside, but on the inside. But what he does is, is he says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. If I shut the heavens up, if I do all. And I always thought that was kind of an odd thing to happen. This guy just spent most of his time as, from growing up and being, you know, seeing 
uh, his daddy get all this cedar and all this gold and all this preparations and seeing uh, God bring craftsmen and skilled men and bring and all these specifics of this temple. He watched and seen what God was doing. And then the next thing he says is that if I shut the heavens up, and I, kept, and I was like, what is that? What is wrong? And then, in, but in verse one, when it says, now when Solomon finished praying, I thought, I need to go back and look at this prayer. And so in 2 Corinthians verse six, look what, it's, it's so funny. You can go through here. You'll have to go back and read it all. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But in verse 1 it says, then, then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick cloud. I have built thee a lofty house and a place for thy dwelling forever. Verse 14. And he said, here's what, this is what's funny. This is his prayer. Solomon said, O Lord, the God of Israel, there's no God like thee in heaven or on earth. Keeping covenant and showing loving kindness to thy servants who walk before thee with all their heart. Who has kept with thy servant David my father that which thou hast promised him. Indeed thou hast spoken with thy mouth and has fulfilled it with thy hand as it is this day. Now, therefore, O Lord, the God of Israel, keep with thy servant David, my father, that which thou hast promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit on the throne of Israel. If only your sons, look what it says, take heed to their way to walk in my law as you have walked before me. Now, therefore, O Lord, the God of Israel, let thy word be confirmed which thou hast spoken to thy servant David. Verse 18. But will God indeed dwell with mankind on earth, on the earth? Behold, heaven in the highest heaven cannot contain thee, how much less this house which I have built. Solomon was wise enough to understand this is just a building. No matter how glorious, no matter how beautiful this building is with all its gold, all its silver, all its utensils, all the goings on, all, all the ornaments and everything, the massive walls, the, the fence around, all of that. He knew it couldn't contain God. He knew that. And then Solomon goes on it's, it's so funny. Look at verse 19. Yet have regard to the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to listen to the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prays before thee. And that thine eyes may be open toward this house day and night, toward the place of which thou hast said that thou wouldst put thy name there to listen to the prayer which thy servant shall pray toward this place. Man. And listen to the supplications of thy servant and of thy people Israel when they pray towards this place. Hear thou from the dwelling place from heaven. Hear thou and forgive. Now, Here's what I want to point out. Solomon's prayer wasn't about, Lord, bless our livestock. Lord, bless our crops. Lord God, multiply our seeds. Lord God, come on, are y'all hearing me? He didn't say one thing about any material stuff. Why? That comes with the covenant. First thing that Solomon did was is he recognized 
that God was a God of covenant, that he would uphold his end of the covenant if we uphold ours. What Solomon's prayer was is when we're not upholding our end of the covenant and when we cry out, God see us, God hear us, God forgive us, and God teach us your way again. Man, you got to get a hold of that right there. See, that's why, Je- that's why Jesus said he knows what you need before you even ask. Why? He knows we need stuff. He knows J.W. and Liz need diapers. He knows. You can't have twins and not have diapers. He knows what we need. The problem is, is we never understand what we need until we get in a bind. And then we cry out, God, I need you more than I need stuff. God, I need you more than I need. Come on, are y'all with me? I can't fix me. I need you to fix me. See, God's a God of covenant. And so no matter how bad far off we get, God says, hey, When you turn and you pray, I'm going to hear you. Because the spirit man on the inside of you, come on. What does, oh man, golly. And in the same way, the spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. When all you can do is, oh man. Come on, the Holy Spirit, he steps in, says, wait a minute, I'm hearing a cry. God's ear is attentive, I hear his cry. He's in a bind. And so the Holy Spirit starts interceding, come on, starts interceding. Sometimes it may come out in a prayer language you don't even understand. It may even come out, oh my God, I need your help. Come on. The word cry, it's a shout of joy and triumph or it's a creaking and a shrill of grief. It's one of the two. And the great thing about it is God hears both. And when we're in grief and we cry out, guess what? If we will listen and do what God says and walk in his way, we can change that cry of grief into a cry of triumph and joy. That's how that works. And this is real easy. That cry of grief or that cry of joy is is a good determination whether we're making good decisions, excuse me, or bad decisions. See, we find ourselves in these spots throughout our lives. And the one thing about triumph or grief is usually it cost us something getting there. If we're in grief, we've done, made bad decisions. Something's happened. The enemy snuck up, slapped us. Something's happened. But when we make good choices and start coming out, come on and allowing God to work on us, and and we're starting to get faithful, we're starting to get, come on, steadfast, we're starting to read, we're starting to pray, God begins to change our story. Come on. Because He is a covenant God, and His eyes and ears are continually, come on, looking, watching, Waiting. Come on, all I need you. Listen, there's a lot of times God's trying to get you to the next level and when you say a praise or lift up, come on. God, I pray. Oh, okay, I got you. He just needs us to break and say, God, I can't do this on my own. I can't fix my marriage. I can't fix my finances I can't fix this situation. My neighbor hates my guts and I can't do nothing about it. Come on, are y'all with me? See, 
See, we find ourselves in these spots. We have to recognize when we're off and out of alignment. We repent, and God is faithful to see and hear and forgive and to restore. Listen, God is in the restoring redemption business. That's what he's in. If you only understood how much God is after you. That's why he allows us that grace until we can see, wow, man, if, if I'll choose him. Come on, have you chose him yet? Or are you still just choosing to just keep living life with same old stinking thinking, justifying sin. Come on. Reacting in the flesh, allowing the devil to kick you in the teeth. Come on. See, some Christians are miserable, frustrated, stuck in a rut because they won't recognize they've stopped growing, they've stopped maturing, they've start, stopped walking with God. They've just stopped. Come on. Deuteronomy 30, 19. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I've set before you life and death, the blessings and the cursings. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. See, it's a very simple test. Do you have life? And prosperity. And prosperity is a wholeness. That wholeness that your spirit and soul and body are healthy. Come on, that's, that's prosperity. Prosperity is not just that your flesh is getting everything it wants. That's not prosperity. Prosperity is your spirit, your soul, and your body are healthy, are at peace, that God's working on sanctifying, setting you aside, calling you out amongst them to use you. Come on, that's what He wants. That's what He wants. He wants to be able to use us. And that's a very simple test. Are you walking in adversity and grief? See, good choices lead to life and prosperity, to a wholeness. Psalms 37, and I'll close with this. And you need to read this whole Psalms. Because in the day in which we live, it's very easy, very easy. I mean, we've got folks that are saying, Dr. Seuss, right? We've got people saying that you can't call your parents mom and dad. That you got to call them my grown ups. <laughs> call me your grown up. <laughs> this is how asinine we have gotten. And if you can't see the devil behind this push of cancel culture, choice and preference. Come on. When the road runner <laughs> do not fret because of evil doers. Do 
Do not be envious toward wrongdoers, for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Look what it says. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Y'all stand. We can't forget to dwell in the land. We can't forget that God's called us to occupy. Because when we accept as a church culture to just say a prayer, sit down and wait on heaven, we quit dwelling and being faithful and then that's what allows cancel culture to come in and tell us that Dr. Seuss and the Bugs Bunny and the Roadrunner are no good no more. We've got to learn that God is calling us to be faithful, steadfast, to be healthy. We don't have to worry about what's going on in this country. What we've got to do is is walk and learn and do what God says and to say, no, that's not right, that's dumb. Come on. We've got to be able to say in a loving way, son, you were born a boy, you're going to remain a boy. That's just it. That's how God did it. That's what's going on. Are y'all with me in here? Is there any common sense left? But here's the deal. We can't as a people fret because of what evildoers are doing. Because in the end, there is a road of cursing. If you so choose to walk with that mindset that Dr. Seuss is no good, come on. If you want to choose to have immoral thinking and think that's right and live with all that drama, then you're walking on a road of cursing, there's nothing I can do about that. I don't condemn you for it. And hey, I'll still love you. And I'll tell you how to get out of that. I'm not going to condone what you're doing, but I'm not going to condemn you either. Come on, are y'all with me? See, when we walk around condemning your sin, that's what Doris was pointing out. Everybody wants to condemn who you were and not see what God's going to make. Come on, man. Are y'all with me in here? See, we have to remember that now we're the temple of a living God. And when we die to ourself, see, there has to be a dying in a covenant. Jesus died for his side of the covenant. We die to our messed up thinking and immoral living on our side of the covenant. Come on, man. Why? Because we're the temple of God. God dwells in this temple. And then that's when all the blessings, come on, they're just going to happen. It's the promise. The prayer was, is when I get out of alignment and when I recognize it and I cry out and repent, God, please hear me. God, please see me. God, please teach me your way so that I can walk. Come on. That's the gospel. The gospel is the blessings of life and prosperity are right here before you. Walk in his way. And when you get off, get back on. Listen, we're all a work in progress. We're, some are starting, some are in the middle, some are getting towards the end, but we're all a work in progress and that's how we love each other through it all. 
That's why there's no guilt, no condemnation. We're just all a work in progress. See, that's why the church has got to learn how to walk in unity and not be so divided because there ain't a perfect church because there ain't nobody perfect. So we're all trying to figure this thing out. We're all walking and trying to head in the same direction. It's when we screw up, we go, God, please see me, please hear me and teach me your way. Come on, man. See, how can we be judgmental and critical? It just saddens my heart when people get so judgmental, so religious that they're judgmental and they're critical. Well, I don't like that church because, man, all they do is preach about how to be happy. Come on, there's a whole culture of church right now hammering people who are teaching you how to be a better Christian. How judgmental and critical can we be? God, when we get off track, please hear us. Please see us. God, please teach us your way. Come on, man. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. We're a covenant people in covenant with a living God who's not some figurine who's not even on the cross. Come on. We've made an idol out of a little Jesus on a cross. I remember some of y'all know Tim Stewart preached here. He first got saved, he was walking around, had his little, he wasn't even Catholic. He had his little Jesus on his cross and Tony Shoulders walks by and he just breaks the little Jesus off the cross and said, he ain't on there no more. (laughs) Come on, man. That only happens behind the bucking sheets. Tim was just like, (coughs) 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 he kept waiting for that fire to fall down. (laughs) It consumed shoulders. (laughs) Come on, man. Jesus is alive. He's in us. He wants that relationship with us. Keisha was talking about Listen, there's a whole new... Man, we're in the springtime. There's a whole new... Life is coming back. Trees are budding out. Let me tell you something. The church is coming alive. Why? Because we're a covenant people. He's on the inside of us and His eye has always been, His ear has always been attentive and ready to forgive. Come on. He ain't the God of the whack-a-mole waiting for us to screw up to whack us on the head. No, He's waiting for us to cry out. That's what He's waiting on. Psalms 37, 25. I've been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread I encourage you to read Psalms 37 because I'm telling you right now David understood that when you trust God God's got your back no matter what people are doing all around you God's got your back Father we come to you we thank you for this day Lord, I just pray right now, Father God, as we face situations and circumstances that are beyond our control, Father, we thank you that your eye and your ear is always attentive perpetually on this temple. Woo! God, let your glory be seen in this temple. As in the days of old, when no one could stand to even minister because of your glory. 
God, may your presence dwell so amongst us. God, hear our cry. Lord, we humble ourselves. We are your people. How are the other people going to know if your presence is not with us? God, heal this land. God, we choose you today. We choose you tomorrow. You are our God. We are your people. We thank you that you've choose to dwell among us and in us. Now God, hear our cry. And heal this land. Forgive us of our sin. Lord, I pray that our spirit and our soul and our body will be healthy. Lord, that we recognize when things are toxic against us, being able to be in your presence. God, we need your presence. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, y'all give the Lord a hand.